Today we visit Sedona Community Cemetery here in Sedona, Arizona. We are in the Verde Valley. Now there's a lot of rich history here, especially Native American history. But we need to go back in the time machine. Let's go back. Let's go back about 1400 years. And I'll tell you the story. It is here Sedona's first Native Americans evolved from hunter-gatherers to a more sophisticated people. From archaeological digs, it was determined that it was in 650 AD that pottery and agriculture began to appear. It was the rise of the people now known as the Sinawa. Most of the ruins here in the Verde Valley are Sinawan. With the switch to agriculture, they created pit houses with grass thatched roofs. And they developed trade routes, trade routes with the likes of the Anasazi to the north and the Hohokam to the south, known by their present day ancestors as the Huhugam. By 800 AD, the Huhugam irrigation systems emerged, and they still work to this day. And by 900 AD, you would find handball courts that were created through the valley. The handball courts shows a link with the cultures further to the south. So far south, maybe even possibly the Aztec or even the Maya down in Mexico. At the Mayan arena complex of Chichen Itza, which actually I've been to twice, if you won, you lost. You lost your head, that is. But here in the valley, they grew corn. They grew corn, beans, and squash, and traded woven goods like cotton and red clay pottery with the people as far away as Mexico and the Pacific coast. The Sinawa also kept dogs and parrots as pets, and wild turkeys as a food source. In the years that followed, they created breathtaking adobe structures, some up to 35 rooms, some you can see today. They were capable of housing hundreds of people. Here in Sedona, there are several, several Sanawan sites that one can visit. The Honaki and the Western Canyons, Tuzagut Monument just outside Cottonwood, and Montezuma's Castle and Well. A little more than a century later, the Sinawa mysteriously disappeared. This after hundreds of years of development at the peak of their civilization. It's kind of like the Mayans. And the reason, the reason is one of the biggest mysteries of the Southwest and is known as the Great Abandonment. It is estimated that over 5,000 Sinawa had inhabited the Verde Valley here. Many believe that the Sinawa migrated north, north to the Hopi mesas to join other ancestral cultures. Who are the Hopi? Well, the Hopi were a small tribe, small tribe of about 10,000 people, and they were living there on three mesas. They say that some may have actually stayed and intermarried with the Yavapai people, those are the same people who we talked about in the Oatman family massacre story. They had eventually arrived here and of course they lived in that hunter-gatherer type of lifestyle still. The real question is why they left an area so rich in resources when all the evidence suggests that they were they were quite successful. There are some in Sedona today who claim that the Sinawan holy men saw the coming of the white men and they knew it was time to go. But the best bet is that they integrated with the Hopi to the north. Three reasons probably are good ones to consider. One, the Hopi have been telling this legend for about as long as anyone can remember, speaking of the tribe that moved from the south. And it's been proven that the Hopi have been here been here for at least a thousand years to the north. And maybe most importantly, just a few years ago, there was a road crew working on a project between Sedona and the Hopi Mesas, and they discovered an ancient burial site. 
Although it was too old to have much in the way of human remains left, they did find ritual garb and ceremonial instruments and clothing. Well, they ended up bringing a Hopi medicine man to the site, and he was able to determine that the ceremonies where these items were recovered were indeed of Sinawan origin. A little over a hundred years after the Sawans left is when the Spanish came. And they likely met their first Apaches pretty quickly. It was in 1583 that the Antonia de Espejo expedition encountered the Yavapai while passing through the Verde Valley. By this time, the Tano Apache had also moved into the area, living a seemingly peaceful existence with the Yavapai. It was at this time that the Spanish were on their way to nearby Jerome, where the Native Americans mined copper. Espejo had hoped he would find gold, but left with none of it. Now the Native Americans, they really didn't see the value in the copper other than as a pigment for paint. And of course they had no use for it as a metal. Just like gold, they had no use for it. Well, the Spanish finally left. It was the end of an era. And by the 1800s, the white man was here. And he was here to stay. Well, today, Sedona is a pretty good-sized, bustling little town with adventure seekers, hikers, bikers, ATV and UTVers, and those that seek spiritual nirvana. And it is in these red sandstone formations in the mountains that draw the people. At sunset, they glow bright red-orange and seem to come alive. Interestingly, Sedona was named after Sedona, Arabella Miller Schnelby, who was the wife of Theodore Carlton Schnelby, the city's first postmaster. Arabella was celebrated for her hospitality and industriousness, and it was her mother, Amanda Miller, claimed to have made her name up because it sounded pretty. Well, Sedona is a pretty name. Now there was a Hollywood actor who lived here. He lived here the latter part of his life here in Sedona, and he is buried here. His name? James Gregory. Now James was born in the Bronx in New York City. He was raised in New Rochelle, just to the north. In high school he was a pretty outgoing guy. He was president of the drama club. He liked acting. And although he worked Briefly on Wall Street as a runner in 1929, he made it happen. In 1939, he made his Broadway debut in a production of Key Largo. As with many actors, James' career was given a time out during World War II. He did serve three years in the United States Navy and also the United States Marine Corps. After the war was over, he picked up his career again where he had left off, and his early acting work included a lot of Army training films. He also worked in radio, including a year there, 1955 to 1956, on a show called 21st Precinct. James Gregory starred in the 1963 film PT-109 with Cliff Robertson, of course, the story of John F. Kennedy, PT-109 in World War II, the PT boat. He played Dean Martin's spy boss, McDonald, in the Matt Helm film series, 
And most memorable for me in 1966, if any of you all are Trekkies, the original Star Trek series, the first year, it was again 1966, the episode called Dagger of the Mind. Now, some of the things you might remember if you've seen that, Captain Kirk was kind of getting into a romantic relationship with this Dr. Noel woman. And it was the first time a little romance there in Star Trek going on, especially with the captain to Mr. Spock's chagrin. Anyway, they beamed down to the planet, this planet where there was a colony run by a Dr. Tristan Adams, who was played by James... And the whole Dr. Adams was trying to use this thing called a neuro neutralizer on everybody, trying to brainwash everybody. But it didn't quite work. Of course, our hero, Captain Kirk and Spock, well, you can watch the episode to see the end of the story. In 1967, he was with Elvis Presley in that film called Clambake. In 1968, Hawaii 5 series. James became the first actor to portray State Department official Jonathan Kay, who was a recurring character on the series. And he was also a semi-regular on the TV series Barney Miller as Deputy Inspector Frank Luger. James' final acting credit was in a 1986 episode of Mr. Belvedere, and after that he had pretty much retired. James Gregory died of natural causes here in Sedona, Arizona in 2002. He was 90 years old, and he's buried here with his wife, Anne, Anne Miltner, and they are both here together in eternity. Rest in peace, James and Anne. I've enjoyed my time here in Sedona, and I do sense some of the magic that is here. But now, now it is time to go.